just uh, we accidentally just got onto the Twitch stream. Oh, not Twit, uh, Twitch. Although that would be <laughs> hilarious if we were suddenly on Twit. This pirate signal. They've hey hacked. Guys! <laughs> oh. Those weird things, boys. They done been done it again. Yeah. <laughs> Boss log. Oh, dude, that show when I was a kid. Oh my god, I was like. We'd be out playing. Like, dude, it's a high draw. Let's go run. <laughs> I cried. And you know what's funny is uh, I, I I wonder if someone could find me the original ads when they when they were first announcing Knight Rider. You know, because they didn't have Dukes of Hazard on NBC. NBC launched Knight Rider, and they directly were like, "Y'all want to worship a car? How about instead of one driven by a couple of hillbillies running moonshine, you worship the b- baddest ass car ever?" And like, th- there's some like oh, I remember the the tagline, and this is all the way from when I was in second grade. But I, but I remember him saying like um you know it could do a lot more than just jump puddles and I was like oh my god is he making fun of 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 the General Lee and I was like what and I cried the first time I missed an episode of Knight Rider I w- it went from zero to deep deep abiding love uh yeah that Knight Rider kind of changed the set of my future of what I was going to become and everything else like that. You know, once I realized I wanted to grow up and have a robotic car that I could talk to. And you know what? Now you, you do. do. Yep. Yeah. Hey, uh, Justin, if you, I, I found that you get less ducking on your end if you're sending a hotter signal and then I, I pull right, it down. How about now? Check. Keep, keep going. Check, check, check. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then three. Andrew check, talk. Check, check. I'm talking out my mouth. And then both of you guys talk at the same time. Yo, 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 check, yo, check, yo, check, yo, talk, talk, talk. Yeah, there you go. That's good. We, we get a little bit of both of you. I mean, it kind of vacillates back and forth. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we're starting to key in on some of the tricky business of the ducking. Um, all right. what? Uh, we're not live on Diamond Club, are we? Uh, we can. Yeah. Just kills me. Like, like you know, the, the, the Ronto is that big creature on Tatooine. And, and looking at all the changes between the original and the special edition of, of what they threw in, like, you know. Uh, Just how unbelievably unnecessary yeah, it was. Yeah, like, because it was like, the, you know, I finally finished how Star Wars conquered the galaxy, by the way. Uh, oh, great, great. Uh, uh, I, I thought he did a really good job of handling the rift about the prequels, where it's accurate, where it's like, it was sort of like, I get it. Your default position is that you think they're crap, but there are genuine apologists out there. George Lucas would like to believe it's a generational thing. Most people don't seem to go for that. Uh, most people just genuinely think they're crap. But guess what? This is this is the hand we've been dealt, and all the expanded universe is gone, and it is yeah. only these six stories. He did a great job of that, and like he go he talking to this guy who's this Star Wars you know prequel apologist. It, you listen to this guy's explanations and. The writer is extremely charitable as this guy, you know, is like, well, no, you see, they spoke that way because that's the way in Star Wars, all the, you know, the elites and all that spoke uh, in very long winded, nonsensical sentences that ran on and on. Oh, no, no, they didn't do that. But that's OK. It was... <laughs> all right. I just got to oh, like, ever like Luke ever, was whiny, ever, ever, you know, yeah. like uh, he had one whiny word and then he became a man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. What was I'll that? Just... Get me being at Star Wars Celebration. Five years ago, <laughs> my prediction of what the panel would be, yeah. and and being genuinely blown away by the the uh, the the Clone Wars uh, guy, the the dude who handles the uh, the the animated stuff that's working on the new one, the Star Wars Rebels. David Filoni, yeah, Filoni, and and him giving this very impassioned understanding and definition of why the prequels are a a good story and b interesting in the larger star wars realm and i'm like wow this is the first time i've ever looked at at the prequels in a different light so i went to the other panel that he was chairing about why the prequels matter and i talked to brian on the way there and it was like what it's gonna be you're gonna walk in and it's gonna be somebody saying but yoda had a lightsaber (laughs) and i literally i walk in while i'm on the phone with brian and somebody is saying you know it's really cool that yoda got a lightsaber right (laughs) and i just walked right all right i am setting my levels here i think we're about the same let me hear you andrew hi this is andrew andrew main talking uh goose uh, give us a new just a bit all right Let me delete all this. And 
So my so. my thing about the special editions, well, I've been watching, rewatching them again, is the the, the, the special, special editions. editions really. Yeah, and is my complaint, my crit is uh, the effects, all the added effects, they look like 1990s visual. Well, and that's just it, right? Is the is the whole purpose was to bring you know modernize it, and instead it just horribly dates it. Uh, unfortunately, God, I just want to just real just one just one quick right just. Actually, yeah. uh, Brian, I was just say we'll we'll our I think our back half will talk about the trailer and all this. Uh, okay, all right, all right. So then I'll save it. Awesome. Then in that case, uh, I think. Oh, let me tweet out that we're live on DiamondClub.tv. Are we? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Boom. All right, sirs. Gonna press record and uh, I'm gonna count you in, Andrew. You get ready. Three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. My name is Andrew Maine, and I am joined by Justin Robert Young. Hey, gang, it's me, your old pal, Justin Robert Young. Friend of Brian Brushwood. Hi, guys. It's my first so Justin, time here. Before I get to Brian, let me ask you oh. a question. <laughs> I wait to see who's about to grab the coffee cup. Brian was doing a reach. I wasn't sure for what for. <laughs> it took me a second to realize. Listeners, this happens every week where I get a little, I get a cup of coffee. It's the middle of the day on a Sunday. I'm relaxing and, uh, and I reach for the coffee and, and Andrew, no matter what, finds a way to swing the conversation back to either me or Brian, who's about to take a drink. That's right. <laughs> right, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> Um, so I was doing some, uh, research on some stuff or some something, something. And, uh, I came across a very interesting page on Wikipedia, which we dealt with this a little bit before. And I'm going to try to play something for you. Is it like a sound? Uh, it, well, yeah, it's, it's going to be a sound. So I'm going to up my volume here. There we go. All right. All right. I hear myself. So. Oh, I'm inside a cave. Inside. What's in here with me? Only that which I brought inside. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. The seventh dimension <laughs> calls to you. This is great radio, theater of the mind. I want you to I imagine, got, if you will, Andrew Maine awkwardly looking off screen as he conjures forth an unusual sound for us to hear. I'm sorry, that was a sound playing. If you would shut your mouth. <laughs> okay, sorry, ready. Couple of questions. Well, uh, do, it's do, not over. Oh, not over. <laughs> I think I think I might have a I might have a guess, but Brian, you go first. Well, I guess uh, this is an underwater sound, right? This sound was recorded um, on hydrophones. On hydrophones. Okay, so underwater, and are are we hearing it real time, or has it been altered in some way? Twenty times original speed. Okay. Because I know there's like that bloop, that that famous underwater bloop sound that that, that nobody knew, it was like bloop or something, but but this doesn't sound like that if I remember it. Um, this is not the bloop. It's it, my thought was it sounded somewhat similar to the the recordings from the, the the purported recordings from hell. That's exactly what I was thinking of, where, where there was like some Russians uh, who were doing oil drilling. And yeah. they dr drilled way down, and they stuck down a. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can find that to, to give a context. But they stuck a, a microphone down there, and I remember, man, I don't care who you are, I got I got goose flesh uh, thinking about like that as the recording from hell. Uh, and, and just I mean to, to fill that in, it was it was literally they they purported that it was it was the sounds of wailing souls because they had found 
a gateway to literal hell. Yeah, here we go. Well from hell is what they called it. Um, they say it's a, a hoax. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's uh, this one did turn out to be a hoax because... Bob lied to us? Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. But it also, like, it got broadcast uh, on uh, uh, the Trinity Broadcasting Network as, as you know, as legit. Um, here's the, the hell sound from Siberia Diggings. Here we go. Now I've got a clean copy of it now. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> this art bell. <laughs> story is nothing more than just my uncle... BBC. It's not the greatest quality, but the sounds are there. I was Here you off go. for 30 seconds while it plays. Wish it wasn't. Rick, listening from Chicago. And so I submit now the cleaned uh, a better copy to you, and uh, I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. <laughs> Man, so, part of me is nostalgic. That's way more intense than I remember it. That's way more intense. Uh, yeah. All right. So it's definitely not that. Yeah. No. But uh, and by the way, there's Skeptoid did a great um, wrap up of this where it's like they break down. You can actually uh, identify the movie where there's an exorcism sc- scene that they altered that 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 sound and put it in there. And then somehow through the email chain, uh, it gets altered. So it's not that. Um, no, it's not that. Um, I'm going to play another sound for you. Okay. Is it? I'll tell you what it is. Is it's a manifestation of why I'm terrified of anything under sea. Mm-hmm. So, for context, let's go listen to the bloop. We've talked about the bloop before. The bloop was another ultra low, low frequency sound that uh, we talked about a while ago, and, and we'll play the bloop for you so you can hear the bloop and. Hey, we got a whole theme. This is an audio journey that we're going on. Yeah, that was also sped up too, right? Let me play it again, Brian, without your chat. Brian must die. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was sped up, I believe. So, so if I remember correctly, the bloop was... Was it a seismic event or a... Um, ice quake. It was an ice ice quake. quake. That's what it was. Okay, yeah, because I couldn't decide if it had to do with a glacier or not. That's yeah, we, that. believe, we believe that, and there's another. There's been several other mysterious ones that have now been identified. For instance, there's one called Julia, which, let's see, uh, let's listen to Julia. It's actually, just a voice saying, hi, I'm Julia. I'm, I'm underwater. <laughs> I mean, all, so, of that, all of that's got to be ice cracking, I would think. But but I'm guessing since you're presenting this mystery to us, you're, that's probably not what, what our original sound was. Well, the original sound I played for you, and the way of which I played the upsweep and the whistle, are from the NOAA. They're still unidentified. We still haven't figured out what they are. Um, the first one could be you know near areas of volcanic activity. It could be something along those lines. Um you know, it, there are things that could be, but I just love the fact that we have these mystery sounds. Now, there are other unidentified sounds that we get. There's things, these are undersea sounds. And let me see if I can find, there's non-specific one. We've, you've heard of like the Taos hum? Uh, I don't know if I have. That's Taos where? I'll play this for Mexico, you. right? The hum is a phenomenon, a collection of phenomena involving widespread reports of persistent and base of low frequency humming, rumbling, or droning sound not audible to all people. So there is a list of places that have had them. New- Auckland, New Zealand, Bristol, New England, Taos, New Mexico, Kokomo, Indiana, Cal- Indiana, Calgary, Alberta, Windsor, Ontario, Woodland, England, Beaufort, County Kerry, Ireland, Seattle, Washington, Wellington, New Zealand. And 
Let's see if we can find. And is this uh, is is this partially uh, um, uh, I don't know psychoactual? Like uh, you know, it's yeah. That also kind of sounds like a list of people who wanted to add their city to a list on Wikipedia. <laughs> 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 Wikipedia, though. I don't want to, you know, be the. Can I ask you a question about the the underwater stuff? Because we talked so much, and we talked a lot last week about SpaceX and what a reusable rocket will mean for space travel. What would the technological advancement be, the the, you know, theoretical or not, that would give us greater uh, passage to explore the ocean? Since we know so little about them, which is why, I mean, James Cameron is as fascinated with the oceans as he is space is, is that this is this entire gigantic unexplored resource. Like what, what do we need to do that we, we can be finding, you know, these crazy monsters that are, you know, farting under the ocean and creating sounds. We don't know. I would imagine the ability to, to grow diamonds in a widespread way, you know, to get a larger window capacity um, or I don't know, like uh, I guess diamond, if you could make a craft entirely, out of a bubble-shaped, six-foot-wide d- diamond, I'd imagine that would be pretty think good. I you need to make it out of diamond, but... Why I don't think- they make the whole plane out of the black box? <laughs> 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 no, uh, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, if that's... I, I don't know. I, I would imagine that would make a big difference, because that's the problem, right, is that it's just a structural problem of being able to handle that much pressure at it's, those depths. It's, it's a cost. It's a cost problem. And, and what we're seeing now is that if you look at the rise of airborne drones, you're now seeing people building robotic ones for the oceans. And you're, you know, you went from to, to send anything down below, you had to have it tethered to a big, huge surface ship, to now the idea that you can build things that are you know, not much bigger than soda cans and stuff that can go along the surface and below, then you can start to build slightly. And there's, there are projects underway to actually Build robots. Just, you know, you could do a lot of surveying with robots to go do that. And it's a much, much more inexpensive way than trying to figure out how to protect a person when you send them down there. Not to say that we shouldn't do that, too. But that's going to be the biggest advancement is just, you know, the problem with like using robotic probes in under the ocean is you have you can't get signal for very far. It's why we use tethered cables, because, you know, the ocean just eats up radio waves. But if you can build these things that are autonomous and smart, you can say, go down, spend five hours around the floor here, anything that moves, take photos of it, then come back up and bring me the data tapes. The data tapes, like <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you will, you know, that'll be great. And that's something that's capability of, you know, you, you know, college students can build. High school students will start being able to build things like that. I mean, wow, that really is, um, uh, I didn't think about the whole profit mode of like, uh, uh, cheapness of the parts that go into it and all of a sudden uh if you are a let's say a graduate student looking for a project that uh that you could legitimately be the first person to discover x y or z and you could do it you know not with the expenses of going into space but instead with just you know a thousand dollars of off-the-shelf parts that's that's fantastic uh, i also can't help but wonder you know somewhere at some point somebody threw a tin can off a battleship and that had to fall all the way down to the bottom of the dark, the deepest parts of the ocean, and I would imagine almost like a hundred, a hundred fifty years, like uh, the trash anthropology that could be done scouring across the bottom of of the ocean. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, back to I'm, back I'm to our introduce summit. you to a project called OpenROV.com. OpenROV.com is an open source, low cost underwater robot for exploration education, and you can see the designs there, and it's an entire project for how to build your own underwater ROV. And there's a video of it too. And so, what? Uh, well, here, let's take a look. This is uh, amazing. This is the co-founder, David. Lang. So this is Open ROV. This is our underwater robot. Very simply, it's a camera and lights, and you can drive it around underwater. It looks like a Roomba. It sends live video back up this tether yeah, and go down it, to It meters. physically it's resembles like a toaster oven power. that you would have a small toaster oven back, on your on kitchen counter. Or maybe like a small um, uh, thermal around. roll of paper it's printer. It. Maybe we have enough explanations. Let's hear them. Low cost and accessible <laughs> to get these out to as many people as possible and see what they're able to discover. Video incoming. Uh, human interest. This ain't underwater. So do they mention, can, can I you- I have this dream 
some can, can you tell us while we get to the uh, the video uh, part, Andrew, do they mention like what you can expect to pay for one of these kits? Brian, I'm, I just found this two minutes ago. I guess what I'm asking in code is keep scrolling down and tell me if you see a price anywhere. <laughs> This is the amazing thing of the internet, man, is you can have a reasonable expect expectation that this has to exist, and then more often than not, you're right. $899. Are you kidding me? That's awesome. Open I'll RV you, cables is reaching 100 specs, meters or 325 okay. feet of seawater, more than double the depth so of a recreational scuba, di uh, scuba diver, two hours of battery life, it's open source uh, hardware, and uh, you can drive the ROV with a game pad. Are you kidding? That's awesome. So right now, it's uh, it's happening so fast. Someone should write a book. That's right. We're throwing in the ocean. What's that? Can we get one of these? <laughs> Spend that sweet Patreon money. You, you, funny thing. Funny you should mention that. Back when we first were trying to do a video version of this podcast with our explorations. There's a book called Build Your Own Underwater Robot and Wet Projects, which I purchased along with some materials and tried to talk a friend of mine into building one of these things. Not this version. There was no open source project back then. This is going back four years. I wanted us to have our own underwater robot, and then I just abandoned that for TV. But... <laughs> well, it's a, it's a fairly good, uh, that's an okay reason to drop on this. And the video is very compelling. It's at openrov.com, and they're explaining about how uh, a boat sank, Justin. Uh, apparently that happens year to year, and they're they're going to see if they could find it using their ROV. I just, remember Strange Brew? Yes, very I much so. I just imagine there's still some dude down there taking air out of beer cans. <laughs> 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 Me and my brother used to say that drowning a beer would be like heaven, eh? But this isn't this isn't heaven, this sucks. <laughs> um yeah, this thing was it's pretty fascinating build on it. You I mean it, they're using kind of off the shelf flat parts, things like that, cylinders and stuff, ducted fans. Oh, oh my they gosh. got an Oculus Rift hooked up to it, of course. <laughs> Which all of a sudden, uh, I heard I heard Andrew's breath catch just then the moment. No, <laughs> I I'm I'm on the other side of that. Oh, what do you mean? You're past it? You're past your VR fetishization? I, I think it's an amazing technology. I think that uh, there needs there's there's still a technical gap, which probably in a year or so we'll, we'll have done. But the the urge to VRify everything is now. Is that because is that because the new hot game in town is the the shooting projections right into your eyeballs? No, 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 no. It's because having an Oculus Rift version two, seeing the the limitations on it, understanding what 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 it's going to make for other people to put it on and feel this is cool. Yeah, you know, it's. I'm so playing let's with get, the let's Apple two, telling everybody else, "Oh, you're going to love this," and like, well, yeah. there's no software here, or this, or that. You know? So with this ROV thing, and, and and let's let's look at this project and assume that we as as we go forward ten years, this could be the most exciting decade in understanding what you know uh, covers 80% of this earth well we've 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 democratized we've democratized discovery now uh, anybody like like money is essentially no object if you want to solve a mystery that's been plaguing whether it's your your local you know whatever happened to that uh, haunted ghost ship that sank off you know in the center of that lake that one time or whether it's some of the fundamental elements of the universe i mean this is you, yeah you've you've created something that you know just i having grown up in florida we're off the coast there's still probably billions of dollars worth of treasure and other interesting things holy yeah. cow you look at people in the Mediterranean where you have Roman shipwrecks and important pieces of history and stuff that were largely inaccessible because of just, you know, the, the depths of which it would take to go there and the cost. And now for $900, you can build, you know, your own robot you can safely control from a small boat at the surface and explore and do high definition video and look at these things. It's it's amazing. And okay. I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out here. I think we're all on the same page. So I'm just going to go ahead and ask for the why nots, not the whys. Let's, why, uh, why aren't we abandoning our lives and becoming <laughs> drone treasure hunters? Off the <laughs> uh, to be honest, it's because uh, we're all in our 30s now and we've got. Uh, no, there's no reason. <laughs> Life yeah, tell that to James Cameron, Brian. like our teens. 
We are prime, <laughs> prime time. No, I guess this is what I'm saying is that like wh- who this will appeal the most to are are the the starry eyed 19 year olds who uh, who can gather the $900 to do this, and they've got the time, and that is a high risk, All high right. reward proposition. I right now, right here. Here's what I'm asking for. If there's an engineer, somebody out there that can build this thing competently, you have to prove as you can build it. I will fund this. Maybe the help of my friends here. We will fund. Oh my God. The night, we'll throw an extra hundred bucks. We'll fund a thousand dollars to build one of these things. But we get to and name if it. We want to hear proposals from listeners who are interested in using it to actively explore something. We will fund a weird things expedition. Oh my God. The first funded weird things. We're, we're moguls. We're, we're rich assholes who get to throw money and claim credit for discoveries that other people make. That is awesome. Precisely. <laughs> so what we need, step one, we need somebody out there who competently thinks they can build this. I mean, we need somebody with some, some engineer. You don't have to be an engineer, but just have some skills. Or it's proof us- that if we give you the money to build this thing, you will build this thing, and we're not going to get weeks and months of, oh, it's getting there, it's getting there. I don't want to hear that. We get a lot of that. We get yeah, a lot man, of that. Submit your resume. Don't don't jerk us around on this. Show us some stuff that you've built, and then we will we will go ahead and and put it out there to everybody. Where do you want us? We, we need to find something at the bottom of a uh, body of water. And you know what? And, and this is the thing, right? Define your mystery. Well, and again, let me clarify. One person can build this, and then other people who have some interest in exploration. So we'll have this thing built, and then we will ship it to somebody who's got this. So if you just build it, and you're like, I don't know what I want to do with it, we'll find the person to find the mystery. It's a yeah. team effort. It's the Weird Things team. The network. The family of Weird Things stars spreading out like a constellation across this great world. This is so you huge. You spare no expense to find some random stuff at the bottom of a water puddle. I am so excited because, like, by the law of large numbers, if one in a thousand of you guys is qualified and interested, that means we have 15 candidates to make this happen. I'm so stoked. <laughs> There's The only reason why why Tensor Guy is not breaking his arm, uh, raising it in the <laughs> chat room, is because he happens to not be listening right now. Uh, and number two, there's absolutely no reason why there is, is, is somebody who knows, hey, this boat sank in, in this lake next to where I live. The, I, I, I'm in South Florida. There's a well-known... There's this weird-ass fish that's super deep that, that you, get, you normally you can't even get down to. They report like, um, uh, oh, oh, my God, what if it's even just to, um, uh, to, to, I mean, to be honest, well... I mean, it's pretty well known what's at the bottom of like oil rigs, but uh, but if there's a legend associated, like people who have worked on the on the it, bottom of oil rigs, there's there's a lake in Florida that their dead bodies come up every now and then because it used to be like an Indian burial ground. There are still sea lake monster myths in certain lakes. Like if there's like, hey, people say there's th- this monster in our lake. I think it's a sturgeon or whatever. Whoop whoop, we're gonna find it. <laughs> we'll find it. Okay? I love the fact that you got so excited. Take- to your local newspaper and television station. I'm going to go crazy here. Ready for this? Well, yes. All right. I have another project. A little bit further out, maybe. Okay. We need somebody a little aeronautic expertise who wants to make us a high-altitude balloon. I mean, you just buy the balloon, whatever. Oh, and dude. Get us footage. Yeah. And we can go to California. we at the Mojave, whatever. We can send this thing up there. Let's do our own high-altitude, you know, edge of space survey thing. Let's oh. do it at night. Let's look for UFOs. I love it. I, I I'm so I'm so, so just to make it clear to everybody, I only said Tensor Guy before just because I know that he is somebody that has technological expertise uh, in building stuff. I want anybody who is within the earshot of my voice. If you mm-hmm. want to do a this, loner, no family, just lots of free time and a <laughs> soldering iron, perfect. Uh, Justin Robert Young at Gmail dot com. Put weird things in the subject line and let us know whether or not you want to be part. We're footing the money. And besides, and well, and actually, technically, um, you know, we're all footing the money because these kind of projects are made possible through our Patreon at Weird Things. That's patreon.com slash weird things. We are over 300 patrons, over a half a thousand dollars halfway to our goal for weekly regular episodes. Just know that this money is not being wasted. It's going to explore for sea monsters. I was, was going to say, that we're paying for the <laughs> sea monster oh, thing um, finally. no matter what. <laughs> if all of a sudden everybody pulled out of our Patreon tomorrow, we're still paying for oh, our sure, sure. Weird Things Robot. And we'll have to figure out a name for it, by the way. Missions, if, you, if you're if you like, hey, I can't build anything, and I don't live anywhere near, anywhere near anything weird, 
do some research, make some suggestions. Maybe like there's something, some horrible, hideous thing in Ohio that you heard about when you live in Thailand. Oh, like, what about hey, a, what about what a haunted is? well? How, how deep do wells go? It sounds like a Sinead O'Connor song. That's a- <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, do. a lot of people might have looked at that Patreon we first announced it and said, oh, finally, these fat cats want to <laughs> cash in. And you think that we're just going to be living a life with caviar and pool service. Well, guess what? We're spending it on Z Monster research, whether you like it or not. We have no wise ways to keep this money. It is burning a hole in our pocket to the point where we've we, already spent it before it comes in because we want to find out if Z Monsters exist. Can we can we call it the WTF nine thousand and that'd be short for Weird Things Floater nine thousand? Uh, nine hundred. Nine hundred being the dollars. Voice. And we'll find oysters that may or may not contain the secret to the world if you help us with this. And also go to our Patreon. Kick in a little bit of money if you have it. Otherwise, just spread the word on the podcast. Heck yeah, man. We're, we're showing up every week now. We're making this a real last gig for you guys. All right, back to our mystery. We're already getting. We got a lake monster in Canada. Ogo Pogo. Oh, dude, classic. Oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a real deal, man. He's a, the Canadian Loch Ness. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait. He's like the Loch Ness Monster, but very polite. Polite. <laughs> Man, we got sea fever this week. The, uh, the name Ogopogo originates from a 1924 English music hall song called The Ogopogo, The Funny Fox Trot. Like Danny Elfman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a wacky novelty song <laughs> from 100 years ago. Hey, for a second, it sounded like the, the, the music from hell. <laughs> I'm waiting for Dr. Demento to come in. All right. <laughs> Can this be our new theme? <laughs> uh, all right, back to our mystery sound. Can, can, we, can we hear it again? Do you still have it available? Yeah, I can find uh, it. And I think, too, is like, I'm going to throw this out there, too. Like, uh, wildlife cameras. Maybe we fund some wildlife cameras, too, to, like, if you somebody like, I think there's something weird in the woods. Like, hey. Yeah. Here's, here's, what, here's what matters. We have now become transfixed on this idea of paying money to do physical exploration of our world for weird stuff. You're interested in it, Justin Robert Young at gmail.com. Write weird things in the subject line because this will be talent dependent. We are relying on people. If you want to be a part of this, we're crewing up, right? We need people. So if you want to do something like this, then let us know. Heck yes. Here's the uh, upsweep. Eliminate, destroy, eliminate, destroy. It, 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 it. I mean, it sounds like the red alert sound from the Enterprise, right? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna guess. Kind of like. Because it almost sounds like like a sonar or something, right? Like if, if there if there was. Well, that that was sped up too, you know. So you're listening to, yeah. Sped. So so it's like I know that uh, that uh, like whale song could be like super uh, 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 what do they call it? ultra low frequency stuff that goes for a long way, but that's not nearly so rhythmic. This sounds like something trying to climb up a hill that keeps sliding down, right? Because it goes like what 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 like it's almost getting up, but then slides down, which makes me feel like it's either some kind of seismic shelf growing, like the expansion of, of, of um, uh, what do they call that? Um, not abduction, um, whatever, induction. Uh, uh, there's a word, scientists, pretend I said it. Um, like, it's, it's either a tectonic thing of like one plate going in over another. And since you mentioned ice, I, I guess it's probably not an ice thing. I, I guess it's just gotta be tectonic plates is my guess. You asking me for the answer? I'm, I'm not. I'm going to let Justin chime in on what he thinks. Uh, I think it's a big sea monster, and <laughs> it makes sea monster noises to find other sea monsters. So wait, and don't you hit me with, uh, it's still unknown. <laughs> don't, don't tell me it's still a mystery, because I will not be satisfied with that. Uh, M- Munson2099 says it's a dolphin with a slide whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Wacky dolphins. <laughs> All right. Andrew? Dish. 
We don't know. Oh, it's damn it. been recorded since 1991. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry I gave you guys a mystery. I apologize. I can't have everything spoon fed to uh, you, okay? Sometimes we have to build so... or sometimes I have to take you down a path to get you all to agree to build underwater robots that we can send out there. <laughs> Brian is so invested. For the audio listeners, you have to understand the the, the look of desperation on Brian's face. And at this point, for some reason, it just all flashed in my head that you're immediately going to leave this studio and go to talk to your inquisitive nine-year-old daughter, and you are going to tell her and make her listen to all of this. And just so you can experience on the other end, yeah, unconfirmed. Anyway, sweetheart, go to sleep. <laughs> uh, well, you know what it is? Is you can see if you're watching the video, the desperation as I realized, as I, I realized that I had assumed this entire time, as is often the format of our show, that we would get some resolution at the end. But all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, wait, 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 there might not be. Ah, oh, no. Oh, no I got scammed by Andrew Maine. I shouldn't trust him. I can send you a copy of the link that will take you to where in the ocean this is coming from. Okay. This is a link you're going to throw in the in the chat here? I'm going to throw it in the uh, Skype, Skype yeah, chat. Yeah, let me copy that and paste it over here. And uh, for those of you guys watching along with us, by the way, we uh, tend to go Sunday afternoons. That's another thing we're going to get when we hit that thousand is a regular schedule. So this is where, holy crud, we have, if you go to tools.wrmflabs.org and type in, uh, I guess, search for geohack, you could get a list of unexplained sounds along with, uh, with specific locations of where they are all. By the way, uh, I am just right now looking through the open ROV expedition list uh -huh. that keep a community of people who are out there exploring with this. And November 23rd, um, here uh, in, in Oakland, in Lake Chabot in Oakland, they are uh, going on an expedition to try and find old Chinese labor camp tunnels. Oh, my gosh. This is going to be so awesome. Well, So people are out here. They are out in these streets, fellows, uh, uh, trying to find crazy stuff. Like this is, th this is not a flight of fancy where we're just gonna. Oh man, turns out it's too hard. That's not gonna happen. People are already out here doing this. Man, they I have a. Uh, they have one of their units is named Vincent from Disney's The Black Hole. Oh, that's great, Vincent um, and Bob. Awesome. Oh my god. All right. I, I think I mispronounced this. This is not Chabot. It's Shibair or something like that. So, Shibo. What else you got for us, Mr. Maine, since you've utterly crushed my dreams of finding out what that sound was? No, Brian. We have launched a brand new civilian exploration agency right here, okay? And we already announced it's not just going to be undersea. We've already got pl plans for atmospheric craft. <laughs> okay. See, you know, that's true. You sound... Uh, I, I, and we're, we're taking investments. We uh, yeah. think we have a solid strategy and background we've we've put our our money where our mouth is and and you know what we don't you know weird things is an idea it's bigger than us it, it lives is, in it, the heart it is bigger than us i want you to imagine 60 years from now 70 years from now um we've got fully coolly really kick-ass robotic bodies and stuff so don't worry about that all right there be some three delightful scamps are going to be doing the weird things podcast from Elon City on Mars. Yeah, oh, that'd be awesome. Talking about those freaky caves they want to go into and how, like, late at night you're supposed <laughs> to hear strange noises and stuff. <laughs> they're haunted. And they're planning, because they're doing our podcast, Weird Things, a Weird Things expedition there. Uh, I'm there. I'm in. I'm all the way in. Speaking of which, uh, did you see... Oh, but you're in jail, Brian. You can't go. Oh, no. Okay, well, I'm there in heart and spirit. You're in space jail. You're in space jail, Brian. Speaking of space, uh, uh, there's a great visualization of what it'll look like um, to Yeah, actually just travel. let's give them the link to it because I don't want to take anything away from them by listening to it without the visuals. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, I'm going to give it in the link. And in fact, I'm going to read out the entire Vimeo uh, thing. It, it is utterly extraordinary. It's cobbled together. It's got the audio from uh, Carl Sagan. And it's called uh, Wanderers. It's a three-minute short, and it uses existing 
um, and uh, uh, some theoretical footage of various um, planets, but they're all in our solar system, and they're all reasonably achievable in the next, um, you know, 100, 200 years. But it's vimeo.com slash 108-650-530. That's vimeo.com slash 108-650-530, and it is utterly extraordinary. The visuals are just um, incredible because you 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 just uh, you get a sense of like for example sunsets on Mars uh, the light scatters because of the the rust in the horizon and you get blue sunsets you see a visualization of of of, of a believable uh, space elevator and and you it really does an astonishing job of capturing um, the exploration exploration spirit you even get to see. Uh, something that that Andrew's been a big proponent of um, the uh, a society inside an asteroid with the you know a, a, a gorgeous haunting environment. It's really really cool. So it's fairly sure. rarely a, a plus when you're like looking at a new home. It's like well, it's a ranch house. It was uh, built in the uh, '40s, described as haunting by uh, by the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this on the 4th, I believe, which is Thursday, I, as a representative of you all of weird things of the community will be at a rocket launch, man, we're under sea. We're up in the sky. We're attending hey. rocket launches. We're on the inside of SpaceX. Uh, where, yes, uh, where which, which launch or which, what's what site? So if you go to if you look up NASA Orion, okay, oh. you can find out that NASA is doing the test, the first test of the Orion space capsule, which the the idea is that it would be a crewed capsule that eventually we could use to do missions to asteroids, to the moon and beyond, and this is we've we've done drop tests of this thing like 50 times out in the desert, and what's going to happen now is NASA is going to place this atop an Atlas rocket. It's and a big Send this thing, this sucker, up into space and let it, you know, come back to Earth, space capsule style, and see what we find out. Man, that's awesome. How, how close are you going to be? Are you going to be about as close as you were for the SpaceX launch? I, sh I think so, because they, they have this causeway that they let you, they let us stand on for that, which is, you know, inside the base in there. So I assume that we'll probably be from there. I'll get a tour, behind the scenes tour, I think on the third. Will they take us around? They'll show us the platform. They'll show us all of that. I think the launch, I'm trying to find the launch schedule time. I think it's like, I got to look at my notes, but it's like, I think it's like 2 30 in the afternoon or something. But I would love to do a live broadcast of the launch. And uh, let's figure out a way to make that happen. That'll be 2 30 uh, East Coast time. Let me check, let me get, double check the time. And, on that. and that's what, what day again? I was tuned up. Thursday, again, Thursday. This Thursday. So uh, if you, as you're receiving this, you probably have 48 hours notice. Um, uh, I think I would be able to do that. And. Wait for it. If it's going to be, let me give you the, over, the overflight of it. The first flight test of Orion, NASA's next generation spacecraft that will send astronauts to an asteroid and onward to Mars, is scheduled for Thursday, December 4th. NASA will host a series of news conferences and flight commentary on NASA television, as well as media events at the agency's Kennedy Space Center. Orion will launch uncrewed on a United Launch Alliance Delta V rocket at 7.05 a.m. Eastern from the complex. Uh, the window for launch is 2 hours and 39 minutes. So that's 7, 7 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so, good thing I checked that. <laughs> uh, Strengths points out that also this is the kind of vehicle that would be able to take us to uh, uh, ferry people out to Lagrange Point space stations. Um, oh yeah, I mean if this thing's going onward to Mars, then that's that's a that's an easy slam dunk. Right short there. jaunt during its four and a half hour trip, Orion will. Oh, okay. Wait a second. Um, mm -hmm. The okay, the it, they will cover they'll do coverage and it will continue through splash down the Pacific Ocean approximately 600 miles southwest of San Diego. During its four and a half hour trip, Orion will orbit Earth twice and travel to an altitude of 3,600 miles into space. The flight is designed to test many of the elements that pose the greatest risk to astronauts and provide critical data needed to improve Orion's design and reduce risk to future mission crews. That's great, man. That's going to be really cool. Yeah. So this launch is from, from Canaveral. Yeah, Cape Kennedy, or Kennedy Space Center. 
Uh, that is amazing. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I have, uh, you know, there's nothing. I'll, I'll be, I'll be remote from a hotel, but, uh, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I think I roll. should be able to do it as well. I'll, uh, double check the schedule. It'll be a little, little, little early, but, uh, I'll be on the same time zone as Brian. Cause I'll be in Dallas. Right home. What else you got for us, Mr. Maine? And then the week in two weeks later, uh, or actually just 11 days later, We'll be covering the SpaceX launch, and what's cool about the Orion launch is this is a big this is a big crew capsule. This is a if you look at the capsule design, it's it's amazing. It's very large, and it's going to be you know NASA's way to send people out beyond Earth orbit. And then yeah, two weeks later, right. we'll cover the SpaceX launch, which we'll talk to at length. But, um, gentlemen, yeah, uh, you know, oh, by the way, tomorrow, just so you know, uh. The Japan Space Agency is going to be launching a probe to an asteroid to see what asteroids are made of, which is a, another big leap towards finding out if there's some sort of commercial, you, you know, commercial function. I guess, we, I guess you know, you know we, we know some of it from like spectro- spectro- <clears throat> spectrography. Is that what it, what it is? Well, where, where it's like you, you look at the um, uh, whatever uh, uh, reflections of light off of it in order to figure out uh, what it's made of. But I would assume that only tells you what's on the surface. Whereas exactly. if you're going to spend a lot of money to go out there to mine it, you want to know what's on the inside. Precisely. So that'll be interesting. So that probe launches tomorrow, and I think it lands something like in 2018 or something. So that's an exciting thing that's going on. A lot of cool stuff. Now... I think we shift directions. You know what I love about this show is that we're focused on the hard science about what's believable and about, um, you know, there's no nonsense in this show. Not at all. Brian, I'm glad you used the word hard uh, (laughs) because uh, there is uh, really no other way for me to describe (laughs) how you feel. (laughs) The, The just density of love that that was uh pouring out of the internet so dense it's so it's so it's you're, so you're, dense you're tumescent <laughs> yeah love uh the, you know you ever ain't you never seen star wars <laughs> <laughs> yeah man uh look let's let the love just come shining through i think uh spoiler alert all three of us uh we've been excited about the new star wars episode seven directed by jj abrams yes uh, yes. Since we walked out of the theaters in 1977, uh, either physically or in spirit, when we weren't born yet. <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess do we have to do a spoiler alert for a trailer? Like I know we'll I don't do know. A, I mean, we'll just say spoiler alert. We'll just say we're uh, going to talk about the trailer, right? If, if Jeff Kanata is listening and doesn't like <laughs> trailers, then turn the podcast off, Jeff, uh, or Rob Kreckel, or any of the other people who are lunatics the and purists. Just, that, trailers ruin the movie then i'm sorry we're going to talk a lot about it and i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to add to that and say that like listen if i could live in a world it's like gun control okay <laughs> like if we could magically make guns disappear or something like that i'm listening i'm absolutely listening to that argument but we can't if i could live in a spoil spoil like i have not gone deep into star wars spoilers i know there's like oh my god like no i don't i really want to let abrams and the disney and lucasfilm control what they tell me about it i try to avoid spoilery stuff but if they release a trailer i'll see that if i could live in a world where i could say, like i don't want leaks i don't want this stuff i don't want this stuff to get out there i want to preserve that uh, but i'll also defend the fact that i knew how harry potter ended and i still effing loved the movie you yeah. know um, uh, well, and yes, uh, and also it's like your mileage may vary. It's like I'm comfortable knowing that there's a weird looking lightsaber in this episode, but I don't necessarily want to go hounding, you know, for casting rumors or any of that stuff. Yeah, because I don't so, want to lay out the pieces and tr- accidentally figure out something. At the so same time, can, there's a lot out there. Yeah, like, and I accidentally wandered into it just just going to I I wound up finding myself hunting down people just t- saying the same frame by frame breakdown of the uh, of of the trailer. And uh, some of them are on websites that have an assumed knowledge because they've been covering every rumor and every leak and every little thing made a lot of references to things that I didn't want to know about and I wound up knowing about, which only piqued my interest further. That I'm like, oh, I wonder if half of this is true because it's awesome. <laughs> I am going to posit a theory for you, too, by the way, to think about whenever you encounter spoilers. Okay. One is that we've seen the level of, of fan wishdom. I remember Ain't It Cool News covered what was supposed to be an early script of Attack of the Clones, which was was 
obviously the stupidest, dumbest fan thing you have, you know, like, oh, Padme and Anakin go to a bar to relax, you know, because they saw the scene in the trailer. Like, yeah, that's totally what's going to, and I'm like, I read like, this is, this is made up. But yeah, a lot of people took it as real. You have, you're going to have fans out there trying to fool you, but even more, we have a force working that's never really happened before. I would not put it past J.J. Abrams to have a couple people working with the sole purpose of taking abandoned drawings or taking casting notices or things like this and to intentionally spread falsehoods. He tried this in sort of a ham-fisted way with Khan, which kind of bit him in the butt because it was like, oh, no, it's not Khan. Well, well yeah, because Khan. he flatly denied what it is. This time he's taking uh, what hopefully, if he is playing that game, he's uh, p- taking a more nuanced approach where he's or- refusing to acknowledge or say anything, and yet, uh, you know, theoretically. Oh, and, 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 and actively, in my, if I were in his situation, I would actively be creating misinformation. Right. I would be well, taking that's, things. That's, by the way, for, for Star Trek Two, he went further than just denying it. And uh, he screened a scene for the press in which, in the movie, it is after the reveal that this mysterious bad guy is indeed Khan. And they had the actors uh, ADR, we got to go get Harrison. Harrison is on uh, the ship. So they he, he created stuff to create the the misinformation. I'm so cool with that. I actually no, thought... I'm totally... Yeah. And, and so now... It's dumb yeah, just but, because it's like, all right, it's Star Trek 2. I, was, I, I didn't make no that. difference. It was just, you know, but now taking it to the next level is if he he went to... he's It's Justin's Express. He's already gone to the effort to manufacture fake scenes to fool people and to mislead us in the most important film franchise of all time, the most important cultural... Fran- the most important artifact of culture of the modern times... I would not put it past him to go to great efforts to make sure that a lot of what we come through when we find out is complete, that will sound credible, will come from the studio sets, things like this, photos, things like that, are fake. They, they're they real enough that they will, you know, pass the, you know, the smell test, but they're coming from him to throw us off the trail. Well, and it's not even unique to J.J. Abrams. You know, uh, one of the things that we're reminded of, because you and I just both finished How Star Wars Conquered the Universe, uh, on set... They, they kept it a secret that, that, that Vader was Luke's father. And they even had David Prowse say, no, Obi-Wan was your father. Oh, and yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. And I'm saying it now that, like, I wouldn't be surprised if a part of the budget was being spent on having a couple people. Their whole job was to just disseminate, like, sketches, things like this. Char- oh, this is this character. Have the actual people who are doing this stuff like, all right, now let's make some fake ones to put out there. So people have no effing clue. Well, once or, or actually, if he's doing it right, he'll he'll double blind it to where people will work on it, not knowing whether or not they're working on the fakes or the reels. They'll just know that, well, it's my job to create this character or, or, or throw this guy doing this thing in there. Maybe. So uh, here's good. I mean, it, it's 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 it's. It's going to be fascinating when we see when when we separate everything by by the end of it. But uh, what we have seen, without a doubt, is that J.J. Abrams looks at this movie as a legacy creating or destroying effort. You know, if if he is the guy that relaunches Star Wars for the next twelve years, looking at Marvel as a template. I mean, how far into just getting into the Marvel universe and we can't get enough of it. Uh, if he is at the forefront of that, if he lights that fire, this is, you know, he, he puts himself in a very rare pantheon that is defined by the Spielbergs and Lucases I of mean, our I, Camerons of our world. Uh, uh, to to toss out a uh, Star Wars metaphor, I mean, this is threading the stone needle in Beggar's Canyon, right? It's like he he is coming in, he is inheriting a much beloved and recently maligned, um, you know, a, a franchise. And I would, I think he's done a fantastic job of making announcements and, and artistic decisions that have a deeper meaning. When he announced that he would be shooting this on film, it was a bit of a wink of a nod. It was as classy a way as you could say, I ain't going to green screen all this crap. I ain't going to be digital. It's not going to be in, in 1K the way The Phantom Menace was shot. Uh, you know, and likewise, you know, you saw uh, they they did you know some charity announcement where they just happened to have this amazing Henson you know puppet come walking in that that felt real and lived in. And uh, I, I'll tell you what, man, it uh, if you've seen the trailer, and if, I don't I don't know that we want to break it all the way down. I just remember yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> down. Pause it. It's eight yeah. seconds, folks. If you haven't seen the trailer, pause us and go watch the trailer. All right. Well, in that case, I guess we should we should break it down. Although 
I, I do want to give a nod to how deeply I'm in love with the white hot viral sensation that is the George Lucas special edition tra trailer uh, for episode seven. Uh, I don't know if you want me to show it right now or not, but it's amazing. It looks exactly the way you would imagine in that the first thing that happens is you watch a <laughs> crowd. Toronto, which he <laughs> put all over the Phantom Menace. Cast <laughs> Walking do back, just wandering back into the screen. There. <laughs> So much unnecessary crap thrown in the background. <laughs> He's throwing uh, uh, Django Fett just standing there randomly. <laughs> just Jabba, Jabba just hanging out in the desert. <laughs> An unnecessary head dodge of a laser. The dark side. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, it's uh oh wait. Yeah. This is my favorite part. It's, uh... <laughs> this is what I love is the fact that this is out was out 24 hours, and we got this. That is the state of technology right now. That 24 hours we've had the enhanced trailer version of it, which is just filled with stuff. Yeah, just go to, uh, it's Tim Tim Fed is the guy who created that, uh, or at least has posted on his channel, but just look for George Lucas Special Edition of... <laughs> all right, <laughs> Seven. before I get it's started, a, all right. we, we need to discuss the, the new the Sith lightsaber. Okay, yes, uh, calm down. I don't care if they do this, and then next movie there's a Sith battle axe, and then there's a Sith halberd. And then there's a, a, and then at some point they're jousting with giant lightsaber jousting sticks. Cool, I, cool with all of that, bro. I'm all for, and like it's like I have not since the Ferguson decision have we seen so many experts <laughs> spring out of. I didn't know this many people had worked with lightsabers. I had no idea this many people had actually had functioning lightsabers and were familiar <laughs> with the mechanics and how they work. I'm surprised. I've seen the toy ones, never seen a real one. And that's the thing that has me like, oh, cross guard won't work. Well, one, remember, lightsaber's not a sword, okay? The balance is in the handle, not in the blade. First step. <laughs> Two, it's effing Star Wars. Don't, it, 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 don't, don't dip to their level. Just say, that's cool, bro. And then just say, like, I hope I get one one day. <laughs> that's yeah, my answer I'm saying, to it. I'm just saying. Whatever complaint is. Okay. Oh, these light tridents in episode 12. <laughs> like, cool story, I, bro. I just, it's, it's like, it's that, that I'm, I'm glad that that's the one thing people pick. Like, oh, that cross guard wouldn't work. Like, what's that? You didn't, you've never had a light. What, what do we know? We hey, don't know. It's a lightsaber. It's it was a developed thing. on a planet where it's oftentimes, it, it, well, it, well it, whatever. It's it was developed on a planet where oftentimes in duels, uh, uh, birds would fly at you, and you needed to easily stab them sideways without right. and we breaking get like, your well, stance. You know, like oh, well, you could just slice through the lightsaber. Like hey. Uh, Luke's lightsaber didn't make it through the railing on the second Death Star, so stop, obviously stop. there are materials there that like are lightsaber resistant. So, what's the problem? <laughs> don't do it, bro. Right? Don't let him drag you down. Don't. I don't. love it. Don't take it away from me. <laughs> so, all right. I mean, that, but that's easily the most controversial element of this <laughs> teaser. That's what's beautiful. That's what's beautiful is that it's so and it's such as a teaser. It is a it is a perfect example of what it, we you know. The movie could completely suck for all we know. Do, do you know why? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you, you nailed it, uh, which is uh, what we saw in this trailer is what made the original trilogy so good is everything was questions. Everything was weird and strange. And you're like, why would they do that? What is the, you know, what is the Clone Wars? What is this crazy planet with two sons? You know, who is Luke, Luke's father? Uh, you want to know, and you, and you, just the fact that we we got virtually none of that in the prequels. Prequels was all answers, and that's why largely you know all the good parts that had anything to do with the prequels were like you know the Clone Wars uh, animated show because they were finally able to introduce some kind of mystery. The fact that with eighty seconds of footage. They already have us in. Like, why would you need that? What what could that? What could the benefit of that be? Why are we doing that? Um, this tells me they get it, and they're and, and I don't know. I'm I'm hopeful. Yeah, I and, you know, you go back and you watch the Phantom Menace trailer, and there's a lot of visuals in it, and it was like, oh, wow, look at this. We're going to take you to the, this place, do you know, and we've had all this stuff. It's so dense. So dense. But there was no, this was, this is, let me, from a storytelling point of view, this was all about characters. Yeah. You know, 
we, we see our, our stormtrooper who seems panicked and worried, and the audio right below is an Imperial probe droid search sound, right? The, the scam it a scan it. Scam it scam it scam it So, like, already, like, okay, this guy's freaked out. Why is he freaked out? You know, we by, get, you know. By the way, I find myself in the awkward position of not knowing whether or not to cheer for the stormtrooper because this is all in uncharted territory where it's like, is it is is this a Timothy Zahn kind of universe where uh, where the, the Republic takes over and they have most of the territory, but the Empire is still alive and well in other sectors? Or is this a, uh, a, a we've taken over everything and everything's all good and so stormtroopers are the good guys, kind of like the Republic troopers back in the day? Um, I would bet against that. Um, but... But we have, we we made the Nazis change their uniforms. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like guys, I mean, your designs were impressive, you know. Also, my, they gotta go. Yeah, you know, there there are a lot of people from Alderaan who you know can't go home again, who don't want to see a stormtrooper walking down the street. No. Um, so I don't know, but you 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 have you, but we don't know. I don't know, and and so you have that. We get, and I'm trying not to use the actual actress names because I want to stay university. You know, we get some woman on some. Hey, this looks kind of like ta- it's some desert planet kind of thing. She's she's running from something, and we'll forget the 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 cutting in there that there's it obviously is from two different scenes or sections because there's it's part of the pod thing. See, this is changes. this is this is your robot brain. This is Sorry. the Andrew Main right, robot no, there's, brain. There's, 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 there's this weird device attached to it and then it's gone on the wider scene. So obviously it looks like they, it's like, I love the Tomorrowland trailer, but the continuity errors in that scene when the girl's like talking to the guy at the counter drive me nuts. Like this, the notepad jumps all around the counter. Um, Man, you, Anyhow, you, you're like immune to change blindness. You you have some other uh, uh, wetware installed. No, no, no. It's just poorly. It's poorly edited. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's but it's a trailer. It's early on. They'll probably fix that. I mean, this I I'm, I can amazing what I don't even notice on things. Uh, but um, anyhow, so you have that, and then we get a cool ball droid. Like I'm in love with this this robot. This roly poly little robot. Like Mike. I don't know what he does. Maybe he's the bad guy. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, so I was talking to Andrew for about an hour and a half after the trailer came out, and uh, <laughs> we just talked about we talked about an eighty-eight second trailer for literally an hour and a half, uh, and and as you pointed out, Andrew, in in the language of cinema, uh, our first scene is a uh, creepy voiceover. I mean, uh, let's say intense, maybe not edging on creepy, right? Sure. Uh, and then our, uh, you know, a, a sweaty, uh, uh, shocked, uh, panicked man in a stormtrooper outfit pops into frame. Can't even go to the official channel, Brian. Oh, sure. is that? A, I don't know. I just that's what came up first in movie clips trailers. It ain't taken down yet, so I assume they're okay with it. Yeah, movie clips is is a is a legit distribution point. I think. Yeah. I mean, I know the studios use them. Anyway. Oh, wait, uh, you're right. Yeah, no. Now I saw that thing disappear. <laughs> Doc got it. What have you done to me? Uh, but, I mean, that could be, theoretically, our, you know, a, a, a main conflict point. The, the voiceover and our, our stormtrooper who might be our entry point into this story. Yeah, so we, and we get every, every character we see, we're aware that they're dealing with some sort of conflict, which... You know, in the in the scheme of things in the movie, it could be minor or have nothing to do with it. You know, Anakin just running home to go see his mom from Phantom Mist, whatever. But I love the fact that it's inter- It's not, look at these amazing vistas and visuals and these creatures and stuff. It's like Story people. and character. Yeah, people. We get we get a Sith in the woods in this sort of scary thing that we presume he's a Sith. And it's like, hey, uh, I'm like waiting for a White Walker to come out of those woods. <laughs> you know, I'm like... So it's it's awesome that you've said that because that I think has been the most exciting the the different way that I looked at this movie post this trailer is in that voiceover, which is there's been an awakening. Have you felt it? Uh, and then uh, the dark side and the light, and the idea that in the thirty years since Return of the Jedi, which is when this movie takes place, that we are in kind of where Westeros is at the beginning of the Song of Ice and Fire. Oh my Fire. God, you're right. It's like magic is coming back online. Yeah, a world in which, you know, uh, the, 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 the Jedi and the Sith are something that we all remember and played a, an important part in history, but 
is not necessarily how, uh, you know, people react to things now. And now all of a sudden we see all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, different, um, different permutations of it. Yeah. yeah it, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, you, you get into two things which are exciting. You think 30 years after Jedi, you have this problem of like, you know, the, the empire, you know, is the, the, maybe the, the empire, the Republic is broken up. The empire is going to retreat to places that it can control and can be able to have and still there. It's not going to necessarily go away entirely. And it could control half the galaxy could still be under imperial control because they got rid of the Senate, the whole storyline, the imperial governors, all these things. So you could have this sort of Cold War-esque way, you know, it could be a kind of a Cold War kind of thing. It's not like everybody got, it's those, you know, we, we blew up the Death Star and, and a good star is part of the fleet, but there was still a big part of the Imperial fleet out there and people garrisoned everywhere that it would make sense that they would still be holding on, which is exciting. And then the idea of the Sith has been around for thousands of years, thousands of years. And, you know, we, you know, we think that, you know, Emperor Palpatine is, was the end all be all, but maybe not. That's, you know? a, that's an interesting idea in that. Uh, throughout the original trilogy, the, the you know the dark side of the force slash the Sith influence and the Empire were one and the same, right? But mm -hmm. now, what if we we start off and the first part of this movie is uh, is all about the political, the fighting, the tactical, you know, between the New Republic and, and the Empire, and then just out of nowhere, you know, and again, there's no force uh, or dark side to the Empire. It's just uh, it's just you know, like you say, the Cold War, and then just out of nowhere, boom, something pops up on the radar. That would be amazing. So. You have you have a uh, somebody point out, but they showed those planets were suddenly empire free. Remember, there are millions of planets in the Middle Republic, and a fireworks display, you know, does not mean that it's over. And, and Timothy yeah. Zahn, don't, I think, covered don't that. Don't you up. remember after the Iraq War, they showed that statue of Saddam toppling down? That's how you know everything's great in Iraq now. Yeah, uh, Timothy Zahn talked about like in one of like the stories of the Mara Jade was like, oh yeah, we arrested all the people who were celebrating. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> Done. Um, you know, I mean, episode seven, open up. A skeleton lays on a forest. Lots of skeletons. Lots of tiny skeletons. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Stormtrooper blasts are nearby. <laughs> oh. Um, but we don't, we again, we don't, and I think that that's what makes it exciting is the idea that nothing is, it's not like, hey, yay, it's done. We're, we've solved this problem. And then you get into, you know, the, 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 the deeper messaging of what all that could mean. And then, you know, the, how you have how deep and old this galaxy is. It's 30,000 year history. And what's cool about like, I, I haven't finished all of the Clone Wars cartoons because I can only watch so much pedantic discussions of trade disputes and Jeez. stuff from, you know, somebody whose politics are adorable but naive. What you got to remember um, is that this is a show for kids, Andrew. For that's why. Kids. But they get into like the like they have like there's a lot of stuff getting into like uh you know the I forget which the the sisters like these witches and other stuff and the force is not just it's not just Jedi's and Sith. They're not the only ones that use the force. Yeah, there's uh you know the expanded universe introduced the idea of force sensitive creatures no, 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 no. and stuff. I know that doesn't count or whatever. No, 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 no. What? I, I can't mention the expanded universe. It doesn't count. It well, I know it doesn't count, but 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 you can explore that territory. Well, it doesn't count it until be. it does. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like you know, it doesn't it doesn't count until you know uh, we find out that the 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 voiceover played by Andy Serkis is is uh, is what's his face? Thrawn. I know. It's Thrawn. Yeah. Right. Oh. God, I, I I would no Brian. I would love for that, Dude. but I know that like given that they've said that oh it's the six movies, the Clone Wars. You know, and, but but going within that, just within what I haven't gone going within what is supposed to be canon now. There's a lot of really cool, weird four stuff in there. Yes, absolutely, and and you see similar to that. Um, you know, they they set up a very very simple set of rule light, light side dark side. You know, Jedi uh, Sith, but there's there's places for remixes and periphery in there, similar to what you see in the Avatar: The Last Airbender universe, where the whole first series is just about the four elements and the way they can be controlled, and it's novel and interesting. But then you see like weird, um, uh, you know, cross sections where, where it's like there are sand benders who, who seem to have a little bit of bending of air, but also of, of earth in order to, you know, move their craft across the desert and so on. But that's getting off topic. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. This trailer has none of or no, or no appearance by Han Solo. 
Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, Chewbacca, uh, C three. Oh, so the Falcon's oh. flying itself. I hope I hope somebody just bought it oh. at a garage sale, man. <laughs> Last time we saw the Falcon flying around, it wasn't Han. He's the one who knocked the stupid uh, dish off. I I I sincerely hope that we are meeting a new up and coming smuggler uh, or roguish type that just happened to buy it at a garage sale and. Uh, and well, that, we know. I mean, we know they're in it. So or somebody stole it. <laughs> we, we we know they're the kids stole it. We know they're in it. Um, so yeah, I love well, the fact. Uh, what, what what do you think of that decision to not have them in this trailer? Oh, uh, brilliant, brilliant, very important. Sell us on the future of the story. Sell us on the future of the franchise because we know the other ones are in there to you know the the, the Han, Luke, and Leia. The old you know, are going to be there to pass the torch. I love the idea that they didn't recast. I mean, I was okay if they wanted to recast and do it like just five years after. But you know what? 30 years later, give us the real actors playing those roles and passing the baton off. Get them, you know, uh, you know. Well, and, but, but also, get, like, like I understand Han Solo can't play Han Solo as uh, the archetype anymore. He has to play, as you saw in the Timothy Zahn books, the beleaguered, tired diplomat who, yeah, you did that famous thing in that war 30 years ago, and now you're, you're John McCain. You know, you're, 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 you're a grouchy guy who, you know, used to own this, this Corellian freighter. Um, like if, and, and, and Luke can't be the kid who is learning to be a, a total badass. He's got to be uh, Dumbledore running his little, you know, force school over here. And uh, again, I want to see them not just in different, same characters, but just at different times in their lives. I want it to be, you know, I want to see uh, Leia as, as Hillary Clinton, this politically savvy negotiator who was, who was closer to Mon Mothma than the, uh, than the blaster wielding princess we saw in the first movie. I'd rather see as Margaret Thatcher, but that's my choice. Okay. Um, <laughs> Whatever. I hold my ear, so fine. <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, we want to see them evolve and we want to, we want, we want, we want a new Star Wars. You know, we want a new Star Wars that's rooted in the old, but gives us, you know, you know, the idea of moving, moving forward to where things go from there. And I'm excited about that. And I think that the, the idea is that I do want to see a trailer at some point that's like, hey, look, it's who you remember and all that. And that'll be, you know, you know, exciting and cool, you know, and and uh, and there's 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 the cliche choices which are being pointed out in the chat room of like, oh, one more mission, just one more time, come on out of retirement. I hope it's better than that. I really hope it's better than that. Yeah. You know? I, 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 oh, all right, I'll do. You know, I think it has to be to get uh, three episodes out of it, right? I mean, they they, well, they, they I, have to... I think if you're, I think the three, I think you you have the original three kind of kind of play sort of a you know a prominent role in the first one, but the second just make the story move forward from there onto the younger ones, you know? Well, you're going to need to. You know, you're going to need to either give them pivotal elements of the story that carry throughout three, or you have to have a story that includes our new characters that we care enough about to go on two more journeys with mm -hmm. and have them be, you know, separate enough that this first movie, I mean, like, this is, I mean, again, J.J. Abrams, I, I believe, looks at this as a legacy. This is the only one of the three he's going to direct. If Ryan, if, if uh, you know, we know Ryan Johnson's going to direct the second one. The rumor is Ryan Johnson will direct the third one. Uh, this is his shot. I think he's gonna he's gonna do the the best Star Wars movie he can that leads into other ones, but is not just Act One of a three act structure, which in many ways uh, strangled the prequels. One of the many decisions that strangled the prequels in the cribs crib was that. We got we had to, we were saddled with one, ep the first episode of Baby Vader and the racist trade aliens that <laughs> now all of a sudden we care about. Uh, and, I, and yeah, I think the, the the best thing Abrams can do is give us a self-contained episode seven. Yeah, it leads us to where two and three go, but give us you, we walked out of Star Wars feeling we saw a complete story. Death Star got destroyed. You know, we knew the Emperor was somewhere out there and, and Vader, Mayor, you know, Vader, Vader was the only the biggest bad guy we really saw. And Tarkin, you know, Tarkin gets killed. And then we kind of think that Vader, we didn't know, but we kind of like, yeah, everybody seemed very happy at the end. Yeah. Nobody was happy. You know, like even Phantom Menace was like, oh, yeah, we're going to have a little celebration. But <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Everybody's standing on stage at that parade is like, oh, geez, can we get this over with? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got to get, get back to my boring Jedi council meeting. 
and we all knew, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, you know, that was the problem is there is no protagonist of the original three. There is oh, no protagonist. Okay. You know, and, and, and so there's behind it all. What's that? <laughs> Uh, the the Palpatines behind it all stuff from from the Plankett reviews, which is so much they are intertwined now. Like now, the only way that I think of the the prequels in any way that brings me joy is the Plankett reviews, and and now they are they are forever there for me. Uh, one last thing, my favorite part about this trailer was just that opening voiceover and making the Force weird again. Like that, if if somebody, if if your next door neighbor was into the force and into the meditations of what the force could give you. And he talked to you about it all the time. You would find him to be a bit creepy and weird in the way that Han Solo finds Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker to be creepy and weird when he meets them uh, in Moss Eisley. And, and that in that one sentence, you know, there's been an awakening. Have you felt it? Like that immediately is just like, Hey brother, have you heard the good news? Yes. Like, it yes. Is just this this uh it brings all of this intense religious connotation to something that was devoid of it all throughout the entire prequels when they were, you know, bearded robed UN peacekeeper, paramilitary uh, escort negotiator people right. that uh, demanded you hand over your children so they could train them. <laughs> yeah. Uh it is as, as to like this question, like, well, who, I wonder who the old guard's going to die. You know, think about this. There are two schools of thought. You either get rid of a character because they don't really serve the story anymore. And you're like, well, we can get rid of this person. We can have some sort of emotional weight. But the problem is that always tends up being superfluous. It's like, oh, yeah, it's like they died, but whatever. Or you go for the most critical, important person that you can have in the story and kill them off a la Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, this per well, as long as this guy's in charge. Oh, God damn it. You just killed him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and that makes everybody around have to rise up because, you know, once you, and that's, that's what I love about George R. R. Martin sort of storytelling is he creates these character, builds them up, and then kills them off. Not just because we love them, but because they could make a difference and make the world better, but they're gone. Can I uh, blend into picks territory here to double no. down on our nope. previous pick? No, no. Uh, yeah, let's start picks. <laughs> like, I just, uh, you and I both finished How Star Wars Conquered the Universe this week, and I want to make it my pick for a second time. It is, it is so good to hear the story of Star Wars told as a narrative and to see the hero, uh, and, and, you know, much like his... Uh, 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 tragic nature of Anakin Skywalker to see George Lucas cast as this can do kid who worked really, really hard and had brilliant, brilliant ideas and innovative and surrounded himself with unbelievable talent. And to see that uh, and to see the, the way they handle the narrative of, of the, the reactions to the prequels and the split in the fan community and the uh, uh, it is it is amazing to hear how many times Lucasfilm uh, was was almost insolvent. Like like they they bet the farm, they bet everything. They just kept letting it ride in some of the stupidest business decisions of all time, and it kept paying off until it didn't. And then even then, there's a, there's like this redemptive arc at the at the end and speculation about the 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 new series coming up. Uh, loved that entire story. It made me believe in the American success story. It made me believe in Lucas as a innovative filmmaker who genuinely uh, did some important work, not just with the Star Wars universe. And there's this part of him that begrudgingly admits that's what he'll be remembered for when he dies. It'll say George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, which isn't oh, necessarily what man. he wanted. Oh. <laughs> well, we, well, he just wanted it to be this dumb flight of fancy space fantasy, right? And instead I, I know, it became I, I, this I, I, defining characteristic of him forever. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I can't thank you enough for, for putting that in front of me, Andrew. I really dug it. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a thousand word review that I'm going to put up on my site of the book. Um, and, and I, I, I've read every Lucas biography I could. I've, you know, watched every documentary I can remember. I remember my, my brother and I were little boys going to the local public library and watching a film strip right back when I used to actually project film, watching a film strip of a behind the scenes of Star Wars and seeing how they shot the land speeders, seeing how they did that, and just being amazed at what 
of how these that these things were things you could make. It didn't ruin it at all. It made it even more exciting for me. And ever since then, I was been fascinated on how Star Wars came about and this man who made it. And this book is by far the best book I have ever encountered on it. Every moment, I'm like, oh, I hope he gets to this. And then he gets to it, and he goes into greater detail than I ever knew about it. With better uh, research. like like. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. He 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 like he takes some of the rumors about like what happened with David Prowse, the guy who played Darth Vader was the you know the body of Vader and did he leak did he leak the fact that he was Luke's father or whatever spoiler alert and <laughs> Taylor actually tracks Prowse down at a convention. The guy is now eighty years old and is is like you know like in a wheelchair is like can. Can you tell me like what was the story behind this? And he's like, ah, oh, I don't remember. And then he pulls out, then he tracks him down the next day, shows him a news article. You know, like what about this that came back and like came out in 1977? Can you comment on that or whatever? I mean, kind of badgering the guy, but for a good purpose. I mean, he goes to great lengths to get the information on there. It's fantastic, and it's it's amazing. Me, this thing's only got like 13 reviews. It's got critically appraised. It's got tons and tons and tons of praise. Like I'm gonna put. My own review, and you this know, this is my... also specifically for the audiobook version. So I'm sure the book itself is is more. Uh, you know, you and I tend to be audiobook guys, and this is no. read by Nick Podell, who I think does a great job. Yeah, click on the hard, click on the book version too. I don't think there's see uh, how many customer let's reviews. See there if on the I book can book. find where a uh, hardcover, I guess paperback. Yeah, let's see that. Uh, yeah, only 13 reviews on that yeah. one. Wow. So uh, here's so I my and my only crit, which is the very very end of my review, and it and is it is a minor 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 thing, but he obviously struck a personal chord with me. Was he talked about George Lucas had said like, well, what had happened to the question was like, what was the the legacy of Star Wars on actual space exploration, and did it have the influence of Star Trek? And he talked about this quote from Lucas saying. I hope someday that some guy will go colonize Mars, maybe in the hopes of finding a Wookiee, right? And I'm sitting here thinking, great, he's going to get to Elon Musk, who is like the biggest Star Wars fan in the world, you know, because the Falcon rocket is His named, named for, for the Millennium, Millennium Falcon. Falcon. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I'm waiting for it to get to there. And he goes and talks to some NASA people who are kind of like, no, we're more Trek people. And then the chapter ends. And I'm like, <laughs> so, so like last night, I, I, I finished it last night and I, uh, 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 side note, I, you know, when I first started getting into the book, um, I was, uh, praising, praising, you know, the book and, uh, uh, he, uh, had, uh, Chris Taylor now have been, I've been talking back and forth on Twitter now and he didn't know. He had no idea that Elon Musk was this huge fan. So he asked me, like, how did you know this? And I'm like, oh, these interviews, da, da, da. So Second edition like this, uh, he's, you know, I'm, I'm telling him now about, uh, you know, the, su the super intense lightsaber fan culture, whatever like that. And it wasn't, no, he didn't know. And, and the problem is like he went, he did a great, he went to NASA. He talked to Mohawk guys like, and they're like, no, we like Star Trek. And it's like, yeah, guess what? If you watch Star Trek, you know, and these people in these uniforms working for the Federation, you're going to want to grow up and work for NASA. <laughs> if Han Solo yeah. is your hero, and, and this is, this is, this is what I, I put in my, my, uh, the last thing I put in there about Musk is Elon Musk is a privateer doing cargo runs with a ship called the Falcon. <laughs> so wait, this is, uh, these are exchanges with the actual author of this book. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, can we get on. Can we do an hour with, with, uh, with, with, with Holy Chris cow. Taylor? Could you try to make that happen? We, we could easily do an hour. Uh, yeah, I'll ask him. He's Cause I'm right downloading it right now and I will burn through this thing in a week. Yeah, I think you're going to love it, Justin. I'm not going to lie. It, it is. If, if it you is love Star a... Wars, you also... Oh, no, no. I, got, I got hit by Andrew with the required reading, which, like, Andrew and I talk about things all the time. Uh, I, I can count on my hands the amount of times that Andrew's hit me with the, no, required reading. Like, you need to read it. Uh, <laughs> we are no longer friends, unless you come back with this knowledge in your head. Uh, yeah, if, if you're a fan of... Star, if you love Star Wars, if you grew up loving Star Wars, you almost certainly love the story of how Star Wars came to be and and this is far and away the best book I've ever read or you know best article best research best backstory on this that that I ever could hope for yeah uh, it uh, is and it's it's 20 plus hours it is a it's a meal baby yeah it is a wonderful I mean I I just I it's one of those things that was drawing towards a close I was getting very very sad because I knew that 
you know, this was going to be the end of it. Um, and, uh, and then it's now it's over. It's like, I, I, and I'm like, I could, I readily buy a sequel. I want, I think as a, as a bio and not just the fact he's still on the circuit, like as a biographer, as a guy, he did a fantastic job. I think anybody interested in writing biographies should study this book for how he did it. I mean, if you're a creative person and you have no interest in Star Wars, you should totally read this book to understand how this franchise came about, where the fandom came about. But if you want to be a writer, the level, like I was, I loved this and I looked at how upset I was with the Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson because that was a case of a writer who felt so reluctant to cover his subject and already had made up his mind of who Steve Jobs was and all that and ignored bits, huge parts of his history because Isaacson had a narrative. You know, he already knew his narrative before he started this book. Where with this book, Taylor, Chris Taylor, the author of this, is let's, why did Star Wars conquer the universe? What happened? Yeah, man. It's good. What about you, Justin? What's your pick? Well, right, get to so my you guys pick, both though. went with that one? Uh, no, no, well, double a real that. quick pick. Real uh, quick pick. Watch Star Wars Rebels. Understand it's for 10-year-olds. You will fall in love. You'll have fun with it. It's a very, very fun show. I enjoy it way more than The Clone Wars. Also, play Far Cry 4. Uh, I, I, it's exactly the game Far Cry 3 with all the same racial stereotypes, um, but uh, it takes place in uh, Tibetan land. Uh, love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, so I, I'm not going to do a Star Wars pick because I'm lame, but uh, I have had a lot of flights, which is a shock uh, lately, and... I threw on my phone, which uh, the 6 Plus, for it being a gigantic roof shingle, uh, is amazing when you can watch video on that roof shingle, and it is a big, engrossing screen. Uh, I, I threw uh, Inglorious Bastards on it, and I think I've watched it like four times because it is highly rewatchable. It is really, really amazing, and it uh, reminds me of, of that era when we weren't exactly sure if Quentin Tarantino was just going to be that guy who made movies in the nineties and that he was working on this crazy script and glorious bastards that he was going to get all these different, uh, you know, I remember, I remember reading about inglorious, the inglorious bastard script, uh, way, way, way back in the day before he did kill bill and him talking about that as his dirty dozen that he wanted Eddie Murphy and Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, and I assume the script went through a lot of revisions compared to where it ended up uh, eventually, but it's so good and it's 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 so well done and it's so fun and you know it it really makes me uh, makes me want Brad Pitt and more Quentin Tarantino uh, movies. But if you haven't watched it, then uh, you're an idiot and I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and it's too late. It's too late to watch it if you haven't watched it already. I so watched. It. I did watch it. Very good. That's not how Gentlemen. we end it. Remember, we want to build a robot. We want to send it under the sea. We want to do missions to the upper it reaches the atmosphere. We'll pay for it. We'll make it happen. We're not loaded. Don't be fooled. We are we hundred heirs. But if we combined our hundreds of dollars at once, I know. I'm a, I was this. offering like, hey guys, I'll pay for this, but in the back of my mind, I hope Justin and Brian. Dude, back <laughs> Dude it's just so in in. Funding our own exploration? That's awesome. Yeah. So, there you go. It's been weird. Saved. Saved, copy as. Man, how, how great to have an episode where we're just so excited with the pure joy of experiencing so many, so many wildly different things. I, I'm really stoked. What do we want to call this one? Um, hmm. Weird things. Uh, WT explorations. Uh, weird things. Um, yeah, weird things explanation. Something along the idea of, uh, um, sea fever. <laughs> I think I said that at some point. Um, the weird X Prize. Yeah.
beautiful. Oh, man. I'm so happy with that trailer. Somebody did like oh. the, the cliched um, lots of lens flares version of, of the trailer remix, which I didn't think was nearly as good. Yeah, I'm like the the the, the lens flare joke is old. It's like it's so it's like anytime you say JJ Abrams your lens flare, it's like, oh, it's great. It's humor, guys. Wow, you, you can make that joke, you know. And it's like ah, like I, there are way too many lens flares in Star Trek movies. There are for yeah. sure, but what else you got, you know? And and you know there are two lens flares in this Star Wars, you know, seven trailer that happen exactly when you would get a lens flare, and you know. I, I'm 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 not worried about that at all. Uh, one is uh, into the sun. <laughs> yeah, you know. Like, oh, one, look, that's a lens flare, and it's like, yeah, you point. I mean, theory, I mean, like you could say that there is no camera, right? But if if you are going for a certain aesthetic and you point a camera into the sun, you're gonna have a lens flare. It's a thing that happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so when do you think we get the next one? The, the first, if this is a teaser, when do we get the trailer? Usually, what, like three months out, right? No, I, I think they go quiet pretty much for six months. Eh, no, I'm going to say March. I mean, the, the rules are going to be whatever they want as they make them up. Um, you know, I think that, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, there's there's what the traditional way to do it. You know, we didn't get, we didn't get, like, I think in a, a Phantom Menace trailer until six months before. A teaser until six months before, I think. Um, and then we're more, this came out more than a year before. Uh, Sign has been begging me to show this interview from the 1980s. George, and I owe him so much. He at one time said, Would you consider playing an Obi Wan type character handing Excalibur down to the next generation? I said, When that, would that be? And at the time he said, Around, all around 2011. Mm. I thought, Gee, I, as much as I'd like to have a job lined up at the turn of the century, I was figuring out how old I'd be at that point, and I thought, uh, well, I don't know. Wow. That's crazy. So, yeah, off by three years. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's a good find, Sign. I, I was afraid it would be uh, too content-related, but that was dead on. Um... Boop, 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 boo. Hey, so uh, you're about to go live with the Jury Talks podcast, right? Mm, not till 7 o'clock my time. So oh. another four hours. Oh, is that not when... Okay, then I guess we're recording after that then. Or before. Um, probably after, I would think. So we'll make it a late night thing. Ah, crap, that means i got to get to work for Cord Killers then. Because I have to get a lot done. Or, like, the jury talks thing is always at 7 o'clock on Sunday. Okay. All right. Um, well, then let me find out when Chad's available to join us. Uh, so, can I just say this was exciting for me right now. Yeah, let's, I get let's plan on before, Justin. Sorry, what? Okay. I, I, I'm introducing Chris Taylor into the world of lightsaber builder enthusiasts. Because I said, like, oh, you know about the super right lightsaber? Oh, do you mean the Wicked Laser S3? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, we're not talking about this laser pointer on the end of a shaft. We're talking about people who are building lightsabers with hundreds of LEDs crammed inside of a tube using power packs that, like, are blistering hot and could electrocute you. Um, uh, uh, the answer is yes, Tanky. I, I totally spaced on that. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, thank you. Yes. So, so is the idea to make it like blindingly bright so that it actually looks like a shaft of pure solid oh, yeah, light? I, 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 I know a nerd that started building one, but then he got a TV show, so he had to abandon the project. <laughs> that he behind him such a door. That's awesome. Here, I sent you a link to that. You can see. Uh, uh, let's see. Copy. Um, I'll see. The the guy the kid who first came up with this Japanese kid, I think his name's up. Uh, I'll send you the link to him too. Yes. Um. Holy crap.
That is not a special effect. Yeah. I mean, that it might is as well the be. Actual, it, is, it is for our, our audio listeners or people, I guess everybody knows watching on the video stream, so it doesn't matter. But um, it's not a, this is, is bright. it looks like a special effect lightsaber, but it's actually. Everybody yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it reads just as white in the center because it's so off the, off the charts bright. And I think we may find out that, you know, because one of the cool things they revealed in the book was how they went to these R2-D2 fans and they actually hired two of them to build R2-D2s for the movie. Yeah, because they were able to do it for uh, for like 10% of the cost. Well, but, but they go, what it cost you to make them? They'd be like 8,000. Like, oh, we paid 80,000 for our R2s. Yeah. You were paying for a thing called labor. Yes, correct, and and design work and creation and yeah. And, and, and I'm sure that I mean I'm sure the fans could make them a hell of a lot cheaper. We know how movie building works, but I'm like, well, but it was like, yeah, it's like these people are like, oh, it took me six months to build this. Well, let's add up your hours. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But nonetheless, like you know, these lightsabers are amazing. It um, was fascinating, um, just talking to a lot of those builders, like at at celebration and and for. Like those guys, I mean, it's it's like building a car. You know, it's their version of of you know, yeah, uh, rebuilding a vehicle or something like that. This is their passion. Um, so uh, you brought up Star Wars Celebration, uh, Brian. Are you on? Uh, you know, I never thought I would go to one of them, but I guess I could be talked into it. I I was so the thing was I couldn't I couldn't divorce myself from my my prequel rage but uh but after reading how star wars conquered the universe i think i'm ready to fall back in love well it'll be in anaheim so it's not like necessarily just going to uh orlando you know Wait, if you have no it? connection to florida uh it's in april uh if you're going to think where would be a place where they would debut the Star Wars trailer? <laughs> that seems to be a likely place in which uh, they, they they might do it. You know, maybe. Uh, yeah, I I wouldn't get you know my hopes up too much about That's, nothing is for sure. But I, I think it's like this: it you want to be at ground zero for fandom. Yeah. For Super Star Wars, the poised. Also, Andrew's got a ticket. As soon as the trailer happened, I got a ticket. Brian gets a ticket. We could do a live weird things. Let's uh, take a look. What? Uh, figure out what day of the week it is. See, see what it takes to make that happen. Uh, wouldn't it be wild if I was already in the uh, Los Angeles area? Why would you ever come out here, Brian? <laughs> Again. I don't know. Seems like, uh, seems like, uh, we'll know, uh, give, give me a month or so. Right on. Uh, all right, guys. Um, uh, uh, Justin, I'll work out schedules with Chad and stuff, and we'll plan on, um, we'll budget like, uh, I don't know, like, uh,